Alan Sturt, please welcome Alan Sturt to this podium. <coughs> okay, well, thank you. Uh, well, to continue with theme, thank you, Alex. It is an honor to be asked to present here. And um, thanks to George Liste for a couple of reasons. One was for starting this whole thing, and the other was to be the direct inspiration for the trip I'm going to talk about. Um, we'll go on. So just a, a few notes. All the, the still photography was all slide film. I took most of them. Then uh, I want to thank Dave Brown, Wendy Scott, and Ann Ingerson for the other shots. And then I took all the slides and scanned them. And then Dick Irwin uh, did the videography on a VHS tape, which um, I digitized. So here is the trip, just to get you oriented. Montreal, Quebec. So we went from Nain to Kangaxualujuak, up the coast of Labrador into Knockback Fjord, up the Palmer, down the Korok, ah, to Kangaxualujuak. Um, we had done several rivers that ran down to the Labrador coast earlier and had to paddle 30, 40 miles to get to the nearest village, and I really fell in love with how beautiful and spectacular the Labrador coast was but it was only after hearing about George's trip that they did that whole long stretch, and it was doable. That made me really want to do it. And um, two of George's crew were on our trip also, uh, Tom Elliott and Dick Irwin. So the logistics were driving to Goose Bay. We rented a van. We had neighbors volunteered to drive us and bring the van back. And then we were going to take the coastal boat up to Nain, except the ice came back in. The ice had gone out and come back in, so we couldn't, couldn't do it. So we hung around Goose Bay for a few days trying to find a relatively cheap way to get up to Nain. We couldn't really afford a charter where you pay for the miles there and back. But somehow, maybe it was from our host, Joe Gowdy, somehow we got a flight where we only had to pay one way. <laughs> so I sort of divided, I called the trip the Paddling the Mountains of Labrador, because going up the coast, you hit three separate mountain ranges, the uh, Kiglapates, and then the Comagets, and then the Torngats. And then from there, we, we did a stopover in uh, Rama Bay, and then to knock back Fjord, and then up, up the, actually up the McCormick River a little bit, and then up the Palmer, down the Korok to Kangaxualujak. So that Trans uh, Labrador Highway, we, when we rented the van in Vermont, they, we didn't actually read it when we first got it, but the contract said, you know, you can drive it wherever you want, just you have to stay on paved roads. So, and we bought the insurance. You had different levels of insurance. We bought the insurance that they said you could bring the van back in a box and you're covered. <laughs> so there I am fixing the shocks. Uh, two or three times the bolt holding the shocks fell off, so I was wiring it together. When we got to Goose Bay, we brought it to a garage and they welded it in place. There we are in Goose Bay, going to our flight. It was a twin otter. They put the seats down. Uh, we had, there was actually a canoe waiting for us in Nain, so we piled two canoes in the twin otter and six people. So having the ice come in was really uh, quite spectacular in a way. Later on, there were a couple dicey moments, but mostly it was just really beautiful. And the first few days, I forget how many days, you're in passing in these, in between these islands. You're not out in the open sea. And it did get, there were some places where the ice was pretty close together, so you'd have to scout around sometimes. If the tide wasn't changing, it was really nice just 
a little bit like a maze trying to find your way through, but there was plenty of open spaces. But then in, in some areas, especially when the tide started to change, you'd have the ice going in two different directions at once, you know, sort of the eddy currents and the main current. And this is uh, Port Manvers Run. You can see the little canoe there. I think here is where it got a little uh, nerve-wracking. And then we reach this bay, and if you can picture from behind where the photographer is, there was a, a hill. And beyond that hill was the open ocean. And we sent two people out to climb the hill to say, hey, what's the ocean look like? Can we keep going? One of them came back and said, yeah, we'll go. The other one said, no way are we going to be able to do that. <laughs> so that's Wendy and Ann looking out. And we decided, yeah, we could, we could do it. One of the good things about the ice was um, it kept the waves down. Like here, we're fighting a pretty stiff headwind, but because of all the ice, we didn't have any waves. This is Kiglipate Harbor. It's just another scenic lunch spot. And being from Vermont with our rolling, thickly wooded hills, it was hard to get a sense of scale here. I kept being surprised by how large some of these chunks of ice were. The first few days, I would hear occasionally these loud crashes and wondered if there was some sort of exploration going on with explosives. And I realized it was icebergs sort of falling apart. Here we got windbound on an island for a few days. Uh, this is used to be the town of Okak, which was um, an early uh, Moravian missionary post, but there was nothing left except a, an old cannon. Uh, sort of across the way a bit. <laughs> I think we took a day off there, somebody's back was hurting, and Dave is an avid fisherman, and he'd stand there all day casting and ran into some char. So wonderful patterns in the ice. And the, the water was just so clear. And now we're hitting the, the Comajet Mountains. It was springtime, so there was quite a bit of snow, but a lot of wildflowers out. And here we're in uh, what they call Lost Channel in the Comajets. And by the way, this whole area, when you're starting at Nain, you're just about at tree line. So you're mostly north of tree line as you're going up the coast. So this is a hike on the hill. You can see the tents way down there. It's a wonderful hiking. So here's a bit of the mountain of the, the Coma Jets. And there was Okak. Right where that arrow is, uh, there's a little portage. If you don't want to go out around those islands in the open ocean, you could sneak around through. So that's the portage right there. And Dick captured the whole thing on video.
<laughs> That's what we call a good portage. <laughs> It was a really spooky day. We were, we were hitting the open ocean here. It was this really low fog and big cliffs on the left. And just had a spooky feeling all around. After a while, I started seeing faces in the rocks. When looking at the video, I realized it didn't take much imagination to see faces in the rocks. And then from here, we went up to Rama Bay. Oh, this was neat. This was a pretty sunny day. So Dick, Dick and Tom went really close to the ice to capture the sounds. Right about where I'm standing, there were remains of old sod houses. It was really neat. Everywhere on the coast, everywhere we found a place that it was possible to camp, there were old tent rings, some maybe 30, 40 years old, some way, way older. And then you pass Hebron, built by the Moravian missionaries in 1831. It was built in Europe taken apart, every piece numbered, brought to the Labrador coast and reassembled. Uh, abandoned in 1918 because a series of epidemics swept through the communities on the coast. There's a, a cold frame in the front there. There were chives still growing in there. just before Soglek Bay. It's kind of hard to see, but there were, we're sort of camped in the middle of different tent rings up there. This was just riddled with tent rings. And we began, we began to sort of have pet icebergs. There'd be like, some of these icebergs would be uh, like stranded on, on the rocks or shallow water. And you sort of grew fond of them as you were camped there. We passed quite a few caribou, not big herds, but small numbers of them, and they, I, they like to stand in the snow, I'm pretty sure, to keep the flies down. We had worried at the beginning would we, you know, be easy to find fresh water, and we, there was, especially because of all the snow, we, we carried jugs of fresh water with us, but pretty much anywhere you could find some. Now this, you can, there's the canoe right there. You really, this is where the vulnerability you feel on the coast comes in. Uh, paddling the coast, it was really spectacular, exhilarating, and frightening most of the time. Here we're looking at our biggest crossing. We're, we have a six-mile crossing to go across a Saglak Fjord. So here we're, I'm pretty sure this is a spot where uh, you can see we're kind of far from shore. There's big bays. It was, it was quite a decision to decide where to camp because sometimes you'd have to go a couple miles out of your way to find a decent place. So I was told I needed to have some sort of educational component to the show. <laughs> so I decided, I, I have a degree in psychology, so group dynamics decision-making in a maritime environment, best practices. <laughs> See, at, at this point, the combined experience of the people was over a hundred years of working in groups on wilderness trips. 
All those in favor of here. Oh, this is a new style of voting. Say aye. 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 <laughs> How many did we get? We, that's why it's not a good way I, I, I to I do it. Grunt, I heard a third, fourth grunt, I think. Dick's abstaining. No, no he, he said I. I thought he oh. said I. So said I said right? I. Okay, you said I. All those who want to camp at Duncan, say I. 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 <laughs> Oops, Wait, no, you that, voted twice. You can't vote twice. Did you vote twice, you little lady? You did. Little did. Little did. Little <laughs> So as we paddled north along the Torn Gats, it just got more and more spectacular. Here's a place we actually got windbound, but took advantage of this spot to hike up in the hills. I, this, you wouldn't be surprised to see a woolly mammoth come walking out of there. That was, we had a salt water on the right, fresh water on the left. And we were lucky, we, were, we brought a gas stove with it, only used it once on the trip. There was driftwood all over, you know, every little cove there would be driftwood. We like to cook on fires. Then we got to Rama Bay. So this, this should have given us a clue for later on, but this waterfall would uh, start out in the morning just a bare trickle, and as the sun warmed up, it'd be warming up the glaciers, which is what was feeding it. So, by late afternoon, it would be running much stronger. So the caribou like to get behind the water. These guys weren't really afraid of us. Lenticular clouds. Then we took a day off to hike. Now this is looking, this is from Rama Bay looking out to sea. Uh, somewhere in there is, the, um, is where the, the Inuit would get um, Rama Chert, which was traded up and down the coast for making arrowheads and axe heads. And a few years ago I found out about 30 miles from our house in Vermont, uh, and they call it an axe head. Axe head was found um, made of Rama chert, and it arrived in Vermont 10,000 years ago. So from here, we're going to head up into Nakvak. And then we took a few days off to go up the McCormick River to hike. So right after leaving Rama Bay, the first place we stopped for lunch was full of flakes of Rama chert, where people had obviously been making tools. Uh, in Knockback Fjord is a grave. At the mouth of McCormick, we would call these the bathing beauties. They were seals who were just balanced on these shallow rocks. And there were four of us. Uh, we're going to hike up the McCormick and spend a couple days hiking. That's a view from up the valley. So we camped sort of surrounded by some of the high peaks and had a discussion about what we wanted to do. And I really, I love looking up at mountains. I don't look like, like looking down from them. So I suggested a hike up some of the valleys and uh, somehow that got miscommunicated. <laughs> so the next morning we started out bright and early. I think we started out six in the morning and finished the hike uh, eight at night, arctic poppies. So we kept sort of getting higher and higher, and it's like, where are we going? Look at that map. After some sections that were really difficult, I'd say, well, I hope we're doing a loop. I'm not going back down that again. So we kept going higher and higher. So here we're on a knife edge, and one edge, one side, you the glacier, and the other is a frozen lake. And I probably crawled over part of this. Oh, yeah, you can trace. I'll go back one. 
you can trace uh, Wendy's mood during the day. That's the early morning. That's how we're getting a bit higher. A bit higher. <laughs> and there we are at the top. Now that's me. I am, uh, I'm really happy to have some solid ground beneath me, but I'm desperately trying to lower my center of gravity. So on the way back down, the fog came in and some caribou came out. So in the morning, this was a little stream we had just walked over. And by the afternoon, the glaciers had been melting, and it was... I'm not used to this sort of stuff. <laughs> then we hike down the next day, back down to the uh, knockback fjord. And then Dave, Dave's an avid fly fisherman. I'm a, I'm a meat fisherman with a spinning rod, but once every trip I have to take Dave's fly rod and catch a fish. So there I'm catching a char. So this was neat, because uh, in, in front of me there were the seals basking, behind me there were the caribou, and then I've got a char. So now we're going to go up the Palmer River and then uh, portage over to the Korok, down the Korok, and then into Ungava Bay and uh, Kengut Salujak. So this is the, what they call the Talek Arm of uh, Nakvak, and then start it up. And this is, I use this slide as an illustration of my favorite place in the world so far. Um, I'm a bowl maker. I've been making wooden bowls for many years, and uh, you work with curves all the time, and it's sort of something that gets into your bones. And these curves were just wonderful. We were walking up this glacial carved valley for about a week. First, it was pretty easy. And it got more difficult, and we don't have shots, but we were waiting. Everybody else would be waiting up to their knees. I'd be up past my waist. <laughs> and we had to cross a river, which was interesting at times, to try to get better footing for going up. <laughs> yeah, this was a cold, wet day. This was the one day we used the gas stove. I had been waiting fairly consistently up to my waist and was starting to get hypothermic, so we heated up some soup for lunch. It was, it was just spectacular going up there, though. So I think probably spent three or four days mostly wading and paddling and a little bit of portaging. And then after that, two days of almost solid portaging. And then the final portage. Here we're, here we're at one of the final expansions. And then this was right across from here as we were going to do the 
portage, took us a day and a half to portage over the height of land to the Korok. We had a visitor in the morning. Getting our shoes on. <laughs> but um, compared to the, the portage that we saw last night about the Lierre, this was really easy. <laughs> There's the Korok in the background. So the first, first day or two, the river was really bony. And this is the big, the falls on the Korok. So we took a day off here, we camped above the falls. Dave wanted to do some char fishing right below. And the caribou were crossing, they always cross at these, well not always, but a lot of times they cross at the really narrow points like right above the falls. So you can watch the calf. So the char were moving up the river. So Dave was really excited to have the rest of the river to be fishing for char. Um, you could stand up in your boat and see them swimming upstream. But, um, so the rapids, uh, the river got bigger. Uh, so here's uh, Dick and Tom running sort of right down the middle of one thing. And they actually, they did, they did fine. And then Dave and Ann decided they, they are true masters of back paddling. So here's Dave and Ann doing the same drop. Then we camped here, and this is where Dave's uh, dreams of char sort of died. We had three straight days of rain. We stayed put until the third morning when the water started getting really close to the tents, and we decided we had to move on. So what it would have been really easy rapids became some long lining, long, sometimes hairy lining. Took us a while to get out of this eddy. And 
and then on to Ungava Bay. We had a few other adventures I don't have time to talk about, but uh, big tides in Ungava Bay. And then pulled into the village, and Tom and Dick went to find some help, and we <laughs> found people who took care of us, found us a place to stay, and help bring our stuff up to the airport. Thank you.